You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. She was Rumpel Teaser on the U.S. National Tour 4 of Cats. So welcome, Nancy Belius, and thank you for joining me. Thank you, Mike. It's nice to be here. Excited to have you. Um, I love the Rumpel Teaser character. I, I know when I first saw Cats in 2016, I could not get that song stuck out of my head for like weeks. It's the, it's the one thing I really remember. It's, uh, it's always fun to talk to. Uh, to people who performed uh, that amazing, uh, really kind of like solo duo track, because it's just you two on stage there versus most of the time it's cats everywhere. That's true. That's true. Whenever I meet people that have done cats before and they ask what character you played, of course, that's the first question. They always know where I played Rumple Teaser because, because I'm little, I'm four foot ten, yeah. <laughs> nine five pounds. I fit the, I fit the mold. <laughs> Nice. Well, let's start with the history of your history with the show, because I usually, as I talk to like the people who've done the most recent tour, they all grew up with this 1998 movie. You know, the one that was the, the pro shot. You are starting tour right before that movie comes out. So mm -hmm. what was your introduction to Cats? It's obviously been out for a little bit, but did you get a chance to see it before you auditioned for it? I did see it. I saw it in New York City. Um, I grew up in Long Island. New York, so not okay. far from where Cats was playing. And the studio I studied at was right next door to the Winter Garden. Oh, literally cool. Literally across the street. So we could see the Winter Garden from the studio. And so I was there from the time I was 16. Cats hadn't started yet. and But I knew other cast members that were studying in my studio. Mm -hmm. So... So it was a lot, there was so much buzz around the show at that time because it had really just opened, right? So it was yeah. very exciting and it was new and, and so it was magical and every dancer wanted to do that show, right? Yeah. And yeah, so I saw the show and I knew I wanted to play Rumble Teaser. Immediately. Immediately, yes. That was my role. That was, I was the right type. Uh, there was some acrobatics in it i also did gymnastics so that was the role but um do you want to know how i got the role well, yeah so let me ask you some follow-up questions on that so yeah. you're dancing in a studio next to the winter garden with people in the theater like in yes. the in the company does it at that time was it like I, I kind of think through like as not someone who's not a dancer but you know people like to play the current songs if you're a musician on this were you all like, I got to learn this, these dance numbers, like your studio is trying to immediately pick up these cats dance numbers because it was this like new, interesting, trendy thing. Or is it a, you're doing a chorus line and all the other stuff. I'm sure that's, you know, a little, you know, that everyone does in dance studios. Uh, my teacher, Phil Black, no, he was teaching what he teaches because there were a lot of shows, obviously on Broadway okay. and we had a lot of Broadway dancers from various shows. And he was very serious about the technique that he was teaching, but mm -hmm. that in preparing us to be on Broadway, so it was pretty tough, but, uh, but a master at what he did. And, but he was very well aware of what was required. And I would say, well, actually, what's a fun fact is that there's three rumple teasers that came from my uh, stand studio. Wow. So the, the first rumple teaser on Broadway. And then the second Rumble Teaser on Broadway, and then me on the tour. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you're, yeah, you know, it's a Rumble Teaser factory spitting out, <laughs> yeah, exactly. spitting out the answers left and right. Okay. So right. then t talk to you about how you got the audition, how you got the show for the, the tour. Like, what was that experience like? Okay. So the show came out. And like I said, every dancer wanted to do that show because there's not, there are, of course, there are great Broadway shows, but as a dancer, you don't really get to dance full out a lot of times, mm -hmm. you know, unless it's a show like West Side Story or something like that. So uh, that was why that show was so prized and coveted for dancers. And you got to dance for pretty much three hours. Yeah, nonstop. So, um, so I 
knew I wanted that role. They had open auditions. I was non-union. Mm-hmm. So I went to, I forget the name of the theater, but it was, uh, it was a theater audition on, uh, on the east side of, um, of Broadway. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And there's about 300, so three or 400 people wow. there. So I remember sitting in an alley, waiting, yeah. waiting, waiting. You don't know if they're going to see you because, yeah. you know, I didn't know if they were going to see me because I was non-union, but you wait and see and by if they're not tired by the time they yeah. get there and then they'll bring you into the theater so i did what well everyone else had done you know they try to reduce down the number of people by having you per say your name i think you said your age at that time <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, um, where you were from then you did a double pirouette to the right double pirouette to the left and then you they'd go on to the next person then they'd say who they wanted to stay then they would teach you the first combination. Yeah. And then start to cut down from there. So I did make it through uh, getting on stage to be seen, even though there were so many people. But I did that three years in a row. So I did wow. not get numb until the third audition. So, okay. So there's a, I kind of, that's a very smart. It's like a, I know a couple of places now do these like virtual interview where it's Ooh. like they're going to screen with a couple of questions. They did that with just two pirouettes. Just, can you do that? Yeah. If you can't do that, bye. Then yeah. it's a, we're going to teach you the number and that's a, okay, we're going to hopefully get you on stage. And then you did this for three straight years or three straight times. Was it each year? Three straight times. Three yeah, straight three times. Sp- okay. But in once a year. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then third time you get the call and you are ready to be Rumble Teaser. Exactly. So yeah, the first two times... Of course, I got pretty far, which was nice. And um, and I did teach myself, well, I didn't teach myself to sing, but I took singing lessons, which, mm-hmm. you know, at, if you're kind of a dancer first, singing is not your, you know, your next love. It is, but yeah. I can hold a tune. So, but I knew it would help me get a job. So, so I learned that because a lot of times dancers at that time, I don't know how they are now, uh, would break in. <laughs> You know, they they didn't have sheet music, you know. Yeah. They would um, they would sing Happy Birthday or something like that because they were petrified <laughs> of actually singing. So I thought, well, I'll get a heads up by being able to dance and sing and actually have sheet music, you know, sixteen bars, you know. Oh okay. yeah, it's it's so. funny to say that because I, as someone who can't do either, I'm not a singer or a dancer. But I've talked to so many people over the years, and I was to, had a conversation recently with somebody, and they're they're like, yes, we are. I'm a singer. And then I'm a mover, not a dancer. I'm just, you know, I can move. Um, and so there's, there's kind of the reverse of that, where it's you're a dancer who can hold, hold a tune and can sing right. uh, an, enough, you know, right? Like it's, even though it's not your, the expertise is dancing, but you have to have that, that ability. And at that time, I know in over various productions, Rumple Teaser didn't always sing the, that particular song. Sometimes Mungo Jerry sang the whole thing, and other times Mungo Jerry and Rumple Teaser both sang. Correct. Yes. So the the first Broadway, when the Broadway production started, uh, they did not sing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, my tour did. So we okay. uh, actually, uh, my Mungo and I went in to. Um, we were actually brought in a few days before the rest of the cast because. I was very lucky to start out with a cat with a brand new cast. New to yeah. So I, so I didn't have to fit in to an ongoing show, which was, you know, my first show. I'm 23 years old. You know, I got my dream job, you know, and yeah. they they call us both in. It's just the two of us. And they said, You have so much material to learn. We had to come in earlier. So we learned our a little bit of our number. And yeah. it was the first what? Yeah. I and, so I want to ask you a little bit about this. Um we're going to jump ahead because I want to come back to that, like learning the show as a new, a new cast. But I, one thing I'm fascinated by with the show in general is, is that there's so much always on stage happening. There's so much going on. And Mungo J. Rumpel teaser is one of the few times where the spotlight is really just on YouTube. And so is that something that they kind of, as they're teaching in the show, allude to? Do they mention that hey most of the time it's going to be 20 different cats on stage but here in this one number 
all eyes are going to be on just you two? Or is it something where it's just another number in the song or in the show and you're going to kind of keep keep going? Um, I'm not really sure of the question, but the number, I've, and like all the cats, you know, that have their own numbers of it, mm-hmm. you know, they have their own characters that are important to the show. They, our number was a big deal. Yeah. yeah. It was a big deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we th- knew, though- knew that there was going to be a lot of attention on this. Yeah. I mean, even with the other cats that have their numbers, there's a lot going on with the mm-hmm. other cats on stage during their numbers. So even oh, if you true. are, if that's you are true. watching Tugger, there's, you know, the, the kittens dancing with them and there's other stuff happening that a lot of the, the audience, especially the super fans are watching. How does this character react to Tugger? Whereas it's just you two during your number there's no other distractions i never really thought of it that way but you're absolutely correct that that yeah it was just the two of us sneaking onto the stage yeah which is you know that's how it starts out right there's a big bang and yeah you know uh uh-huh cause some more mischief (laughs) yeah okay let's let's go back to the now your cast you're in a new cast you obviously get to do a little with your Mungo Jerry first, but now you're going to all come together and learn the show. What I'm fascinated by, like what you remember that you were told, because there's so much backstory and nuance to the show, but at the same time, there's all this dance numbers, all this singing, all this, you know, blocking that you have to be ready for. How much character development do you actually get when you're doing that ahead of tour? The major thing I remember was when we all met and it was a I believe it was the first day of the uh, rehearsals at 890 Studios, uh, Broadway. We were told to lie on the ground, all of us as cats, mm-hmm. right? And it probably was 10 minutes, it was a while. And they walk us through what was going on. You know, the sun is coming through the window and cats sleep like, well, I don't know, 80% of their lives. Yes. You know, just stretch and just feel like a cat, right? So they wanted people just to experience being a cat and then now crawl around on the ground and explore. And, and so they, they walked us through this for a while, let us improv. And then at the end of it, we all had to come together into one big clump into the middle of the studio on top of each other mm-hmm. and just hang out. Just yeah, it was, roll around together. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember that the most about the dance, about the rehearsals. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just met all these people, right? And we're just lying on top of each other. <laughs> yeah. They're almost trying to break the human out of your, your movements. So that way you can, you know, embody the cat for, yes. for eight times a week. You know, it's like you're almost a cat more than you're a human during the time on tour. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that was extremely important during that time that, uh, yeah, the cat movements and to mm-hmm. really in- incorporate that into your body and know what that feels like. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. What do you remember about the plot that they told you and the backstories for Mungo Jerry and Rebel Teaser? Uh, I would say that there was a lot of direction, or at least that I don't remember. I was 23, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I remember a lot of choreography and I do remember... Um, each movement having a meaning, you know, whether okay. you're, you know, you're stretching up, looking at the moon or, you know, whatever you're feeling so that when you're dancing, everything has a something behind it. So that that was a key element. So maybe not necessarily to do with your character, uh, so yeah. just to do with movement itself. Um, character development you came on your own more mm-hmm. so, although they did tell us we were mischievous and the song kind of tells you what you are, right? Yeah. Who we are. That's what we're saying. This is who we are, right? This is what we do. We create havoc in the house and steal things and, you know, and then we try to one up each other, right? So it was me. It was me. You know, it was him. Yeah. It depends, you know, if we want the blame or if we want to, you know, if we want the credit. <laughs> yeah. So that was what it was. So we were kittens, right? Remember, Mungo Dare and Rumble Tees are kitten mm-hmm. and they're just having fun. And they don't really have much of a conscience. <laughs> they're just, you know. Do, do you think that they're bad or they're just kind of like, 
I always like equated them to um, a rich family's, like a rich dad, where the kids are kind of like fake mischievous, and they're mischievous knowing that they're probably not going to get in a lot of trouble, or are they actually bad and part of like McCavity's crime game? I don't know if they're bad. No, I don't think that they're McCavity's side gig there. Okay. I think I think they're just, I think they grew up together. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they were um, brother and sister or if they came from the same litter or the, just the same tribe. And they, they just had fun together. And then they just kept, you know, getting away with one thing or the other, you know, or the owners got them and put them together. Yeah. Yeah. And then they started, you know, oh, exploring. And, and then it was fun, you know. But I don't, I don't know if they're bad, but they do get into trouble and they do like to create a little mischief because they think it's fun. Yeah. They cause a nuisance. It's not like they're, they're horrible or like the, you know, McCavity seems like bad. Um, yes, do you, McCavity, yeah. did you, did you ever talk with your Mungo Jerry about that relationship? Like, did you decide that your brother and sister or that you're potentially together or like how much of those conversations happen when you're on tour? And I know this was a while ago, but thinking back, did you, did you have deep conversations about Rumble Teaser is maybe this relationship with Jenny Any Dots and this relationship with Mungo Jerry? We did not, but I, I listening to your podcast, uh, I heard you ask those questions and yeah. I thought, Ooh, that's very interesting to see who, who was this person, who was, Jenny Annie Dots to us, but you know, yeah, I didn't really get that deep into it, I guess it was, but I will say that Mungo Jerry and Mungo Jerry, as my partner, um, we didn't talk about, at least that I don't remember who we were, but I knew we were partners mm -hmm. in crime, so to say, and, but we had a connection that when we met, so we had a natural uh, friendship. Yeah. That, that did, um, come out on stage. Yeah. And actually, um, like when we met, we thought we had known each other, you know, for a long time. And we were almost silly, just even off, off, uh, when we weren't, you know, rehearsing, we were just like little kids together. So we were, we had that, or we already had that natural, um, connection. And then when people met us, when the rest of the cast came in, they thought we knew each other for years. Yeah. And we met each other, you know, two days or a few days before. Yeah. So that was, uh, that made our number special, I think, because then mm -hmm. we had that chemistry that way. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I've thought a lot about this as I've talked to more of your tour and tour two and three, is that I'm wondering how much of this relationship backstory stems from the internet and the social media discourse and all of the fandom that came from it that can have mm. those conversations that probably aren't as relevant, you know, when it's pre-internet. There's just less people, like if you all aren't thinking about it, nobody at the stage door is probably coming in or sending you messages on a social media platform like now. That's what's happening is mm. there's these like conversations because, oh, these two actors did this look on stage? Are they together? Are they this? Are they that? <laughs> and all of that, I think probably maybe happened as conversations, but there wasn't an outlet for it. There wasn't a hundred and almost 50 episodes of a podcast discussing this. There wasn't Tumblr pages of people making assumptions. There wasn't a Wikipedia page of fandom with every potential combination of mother, daughter, brother, sister together relationships that there that exist today and it's fascinating to me to hear that your your like group doesn't even like it's like yeah we kind of like talked a little bit about this but then you went out and danced and performed an incredible number and did not i'm sure none of you thought about that that grisbell was a jellical choice and even considered that um as a is there another option and that to me is just so crazy about current modern like everyone has an opinion everyone has the ability to assess stuff and then also share it that probably just wasn't happening at that same level years ago. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Yeah. I mean, we did know that someone was going to go to Cat Heaven. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's the whole show, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you probably didn't debate it. You didn't debate, should it no. be her? 
Um, it's no, just, because we didn't choose. And, yep. and, and remember, I was a kitten. So yeah. I didn't really care about the adult <laughs> conversation going on there. <laughs> yeah, you're, <laughs> not, you're, not, you're not even thinking about it. It's not your time. No, <laughs> no it's not my time. Yeah. yeah let, let them figure it out. But all I knew is that, you know, Grizabella was beautiful at one time. Yeah. I didn't know why. I didn't know what she did. And I knew that people shunned her. Yep. So that, that would be what a kid would think, right? Yep. And that's kind of all you need to know, right? When you're playing mm -hmm. your character, you don't need to go any yeah. deeper because you're just supposed to be mischievous and, you know, causing problems and trouble versus having any say in the jellical choice. Right. What would a kitten or a child comprehend yeah. at that time? So that's how I looked at my character. You know, that, that would be... Yeah, that, that was that was my point of view. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for more of The Wrong Cat Died. I want to ask a little bit about when you had a different Mungo Jerry. Mm -hmm. How hard is that? You know, if someone swings in or you change over the years, how hard is it to adjust in something that is so such an intimate number that you do eight times a week with the same person to have that kind of flip for somebody new for one show or a couple shows in a row. Like, how do you as a performer make those tweaks to be able to handle something like that where it almost breaks your norm and your routine? Mm. You know, breaking norm and routine is not a bad thing totally. when you do eight shows a week, right? And um, that, that, that's, I remember the director saying early on that you're going to be doing eight shows a week and that everything might become tedious after a while and you're going to look for something to go wrong or yeah. something because you have to kind of find something new for yourself even if the audience doesn't see it to keep things going right yeah and uh, just just so sometimes sometimes you can say i don't it could be as small as you know a, pretend you had a, a cocktail before you went out yeah. on stage <laughs> you know no so, um something as small as that can change how you perform yeah but the audience wouldn't see that it just gives it a little element of uh something new right yeah and for someone so another mungo would be that something new mm -hmm. and of course everyone that was playing the show and of course the swings were excellent and amazing yeah. what performers and um so it was easy to transition with that of course you have a slightly different connection yeah. But the number still comes across and you're still working together and creating mischief together. Of course, the cartwheels that can get the horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. that's the one thing that you have to practice. Yeah. Yeah. Before you... <laughs> yeah although yeah. I will say there's a fun moment, because I know you like fun moments too. Um, with my original Mungo. We had it was a particular I don't know. We we were being silly before we even got on stage, right? So we get on stage and we're kind of, it was a different lightness that night for some mm -hmm. reason. And we're building up the number. You know, the number builds up and builds yep. up and builds up. And we were having so much fun that when we get to the cartwheels, we're doing the cartwheels and we fall out of the cartwheels uh, halfway through because we're giggling and we're laughing and it was funny. And then we run to the front and it was, it was actually just the way it was supposed to be because it was just lighthearted and fun, but it was, yeah, it didn't, yeah. didn't yeah. make it all the way to, across the stage. Uh, we did, yeah. I think we did three cartwheels or something. Yeah. Enough yeah. that the audience gets their, their, their view of it. Yeah, I, and then I, it, two kittens every fun, so we just go. Which is the point, right? That's the number, yeah. Yeah. This is That's a great segue into, I love hearing fun stories. What are the other memorable tour stories that like you, that you vividly will never forget? Hmm. Uh, hmm. No pun intended. My memory is not serving me now. Yeah. <laughs> I think of that. If I think of something, I'll bring it up. How about that? <laughs> okay. It's me right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I remember the, the cat, just a general, um, I was so lucky to be in the cast I was besides starting out with them, but, uh, and I know, and believe it or not, this doesn't happen all the time from what I've heard. Uh, we connected 
the whole cast. And we are still friends. Mm -hmm. And and we adore each other. And just there's just a magical connection between us. And I think that transcended onto, onto the stage, which is what made our production quite special. Yeah. Um, well, of course, all the cast were special, but I really felt that I was just special because we just had a bond yeah. that we can't make up. And yeah, we still see each other a lot. We have reunions. And, and uh, so that was my introduction to Broadway it was this type of cast. And then I was lucky enough to even go on to another show, Gypsy, and, and had the same experience. So, but I have heard that some cast, they just, they don't, they, they do their show, but they don't connect. Mm -hmm. like that they, yeah. And we just, we just did. So, yeah. You know, I've, as I've talked to more and more people, not just in the cats world, in the Broadway world, it seems like there is certain runs of shows or shows or tours where it's work. And there mm -hmm. are others where it's like really, really a family and fun. Yeah. And I don't know if there's, if it's just related to the people you're with or certain conditions or maybe the way the tour's put on or something else that goes into it. I have noticed that it seems like a higher, like disproportionately high number of cats tours have had that family feel. Mm. And I'm wondering if it's because, as you said earlier, 10 minutes into audition or into your, your rehearsals, you are lying on top of each other. And it's almost kind of like, I think the way the show is built and just the way you have to perform together on stage, the ball is so intimate. You kind of have to, like, it's going to be a lot harder to treat that as just a job because yeah. you are a lot closer. Whereas other shows, you're working together, but you're not fully lifting and dancing on top of each other nearly as much. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've, I've always wondered that if it is because of the way the show's composed, that it does seem to skew higher or if it's just great, great casting where you're casting a really good caliber group of people who, who form bonds and are, you know, are able to connect in a different way uh, with each other in the audience. I would say that that's true. That the, it, well, it's, it's a combination, um, Yeah, but uh, yeah, I could say that, but then in gypsy, it's not the same. Yeah. Sort of, it's really a few person cast, you know, that, where cats is an a an ensemble, yeah. So, um, so that's an interesting thing to um, to look at. Uh, yeah. I do. I did figure. I do remember two funny. Uh, let's hear them. So, uh, one is we had a bus fire. A bus fire. Yeah, in wow. Nashville. So I think it was in Nashville. We. Um, we did fly there and then we got onto, uh, we all got onto different buses and one bus had my luggage on it. The telephone, my perspective. And I was on another bus. And so there was some cast and crew on that, that particular bus. And then we're all driving to the hotel and then one of the buses caught fire. Wow. And luckily everyone got out. Yeah. And, but it was on the news. It was on the local news. And so I lost all my, my clothes, which we were only allowed to bring two suitcases, which makes sense uh, throughout the entire tour. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but uh, yeah, everything was gone. An entire That's bus, like cargo, essentially gone. Was it your clothes? Did they lose any costumes or anything too that made it kind of no a scramble? No costumes. Okay. No, this was all personal things. The musicians lost some stuff. You know, they had wow. their things on there. But um, yeah, so there was a fire and it made it into the news and you could probably find it online yeah <laughs> yeah and what was the other one was shoot no i forgot that one <laughs> okay well if you remember we'll come back to it oh oh I, it was um the theater i think it was in pennsylvania because it wasn't that far from okay. new york and i remember that being important because a lot of times we weren't that close to new york mm -hmm. where people that we knew could come see the show easily yeah so but it ended up being a highly, uh, the theater was highly uh, uh, patroned by subscribers. So okay. there were a lot of older patrons yeah. that would the show. So we didn't get good reviews there because sometimes just, you know, it's not the show. It's not us. It's just, it's not their thing. You know? Yes. Well, 
So they, they weren't crazy about the show in, in general. And um, so we knew that, right? We had that in our mind. We were only there for a few days, but that was in our mind. So we're dancing one day. We're doing the show. And the end, almost at the end of the first, first act, we see people getting up and walking out of the theater. Yeah. And we feel, do they really know what gives that much that they're yeah. getting up in the first act? So we're all still dancing and you, we'll kind of have our eye looking at the audience as we're doing the show, trying to figure out what's going on until one of the cast managers said, but there's that moment where we just sit down yeah, and he yeah. says, stay, just stay, don't move. So we stay. And then we find out there was a, a fire outside in the lobby. There was two fires at Kessler. Oh, <laughs> or a fire alarm went off or something. So they were getting up to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That it's is funny. crazy. Yeah. I, you know, I've, um, so I'm, I'm originally from Indiana. I, I do live in New York ah. now, but I have been, um, with my, my mom's a subscriber to the Broadway tour Ooh. and goes to all the shows and she loves, loves this stuff. But I have been with her too. And I, I'm not going to say which Jukebox Rocks musical it was, but I went to one that was, did not do as well, um, <laughs> as the show. And I watched probably, I want to say 30 or 40 people all above the age of 60 or 70 get up within 10 minutes and leave. And wow. just like, this isn't a show for me. And, and I was kind of, I was fascinated by it because I liked the, the band that was, this was about, and I was enjoying the show, but I also mm. was like, I can kind of understand that. And they have season tickets for all the shows and they just go and, um, but I've, it, it is an interesting one because Cats is polarizing. Cats either has <laughs> people that love it or hate it and kind of no middle. And I could see that being a subscriber one. But it's it's crazy to hear that you're all thinking, oh, man, this wasn't wasn't for th this was just the bad audience. It's like, no, there's a fire outside. We probably yeah. should all be getting off stage. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny. Th th those are two funny memories. I, uh, those are, those are always fun. It's such an interesting thing to hear because it's live theater, so much happening. And it's yeah. just like, what do you remember and sticks in your brain from years later? But let's do some fun questions. My rapid fire questions here to kind of bring mm -hmm. us home. So if you could go on for one night for any cat, forget age, uh, body type, dancing, singing, male, female, if you could just do one performance for one night as one cat, who would you want to go on as? Hmm. I would love to be the white cat, but I don't have that extension. But yeah. let's pretend I do. So I, I ask this pretend. question as someone who can do none of these. So <laughs> I, I always like to know just what would be the one. So that's, yeah, the white cat would be a, an incredible one to do one. Yeah. Time. And I want to be able to do this. Yeah. <laughs> who are your favorite and least favorite cat characters from the show? So remove the people, which cat bugs you and which one do you love? Uh, well, McCavity, of course, is the one that no one really likes. Yeah. <laughs> well, some people do. Some of the women that are, you know, the sexy yeah. women, they, they, they can't help themselves. But <laughs> um, the one I like the most, I like Gus. All right. He's That's sweet. Good. He's sweet. He's like an old grandfather, you know. This is so. hopefully a good sign for my, my last question. Yeah, but um, I did like Tom Valerina too. Yeah, so she was fun, and I did kind of admire her mm -hmm. as a you know as like a young girl kitten, so, you know that I could grow into being yeah someone from Bel Bel Yeah, yeah, sure. definitely. What's your favorite song from the show? Uh, besides Mugger Jar Bubble Teaser, yeah. I would say of course Memories is the crowd pleaser, and it is a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. So I it is my favorite song. Um, I I listened to the lyrics again before the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean it. it's such a power, powerful song. So it, it is great. I my when I first uh, started doing this, my answer to this question was Mungo Jerry Rumble Teaser for oh, for ages. Wow. It's just so fun, and it was stuck in my head again for weeks. Mm. Um, okay, I always ask one fun question. I had a different one written, but based on your stories, I feel like I have to ask this one now. Which cat do you think would be the best fireman? Cause you've Fireman? barely, yeah. Cause your, your show had fire, fire issues left and right. If mm. we, if we were, if we were going to have to hire one of the cats 
character wise to be be in charge here of putting out all these fires that your your tour was having who would be the best at it monkey strap i think yeah i think monkey strap was i was thinking um and he I, was handsome too he had a handsome yeah okay yeah so mm-hmm. he fits fits the stereotype for, yes. for fireman mm-hmm. okay right all right million dollar question i've argued at length that i don't think grizabella should be the right jellical choice so i want to hear you nancy if you are putting on your old Deuteronomy hat and you're going to get to pick the the cat to go to the heavy side layer, who are you picking and why? Okay. So I actually did some research on this to bring back Love my it. own memories on this. So if I were old Deuteronomy, I would be looking at Gus or Grisabella, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it would be a toss up. Um, Gus is weak and yeah, but he loves to tell his stories and could he last another year? And, you know, he tells the same old story all the time, all the time. We go yeah. around, and around and listen to him, right? So he's loved and Grizabella's had a hard time. She's mm-hmm. maybe, we don't know why she's where she is. She said, and old Deuteronomy probably does. As a kitten, I don't know. I'm yeah. sure the old cats know why she's... She was once the glamour cat and now she's worn and tattered and and did she wish it could have been anything from circumstances to her own doing. Did she make bad choices? Did yeah. she you know, why was she the glamour cat? But you know, what type of glamour cat? Was she an actress? Was she, you know? So did she lose her beauty and then couldn't handle it? I mean, there's so many ways to look at that that you don't know why she is where she is. So that all I know is that we, that, that the adult cats don't want to have anything to do with her. Mm -hmm. Right. So I just follow along. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, but so she's, she's made some bad choices or was, or was given bad circumstances that put her where she is. And I think that she's probably the best choice because she can come back in a new life because that's what the song says. Right. Mm -hmm. And she's going to come back and have a new Jellicle life. And she needs a new one. Gus, yes, he needs a new body, right? So he's, yeah. he's going to come back. But um, he could probably last another year. And I would guess that he would be the next year. The, the cat chosen for the next year. Yeah. Okay. So you, have, you had it as a two-person race. And you've, yes. got, you've got, you're picking Grizz over because... The need is there more. So here's my question for all the Grizabella choices is mm-hmm. when old Deuteronomy picks, does he have the same criteria every year or is he kind of making this up on the fly each year based on what the cats need? Because I've always thought about if Grizabella is the choice and, and there's the fairness of like, that's a redemption story. And I, I totally mm-hmm. get her argument. Is there another cat that was exiled that's coming back next year? Or is it a different decision criteria next year for the Jellicle choice? I think it would be a different criteria. I think old Deuteronomy is very wise mm-hmm. and all knowing and watching over everyone and, and forgiving. And um, I think he would decide what would be best for I me. Mean, there's someone, another. Another cat could, something could happen to another cat, not just age. Yeah. Right. Might, that might need some, a new life, right? We all have nine. So, yeah. You know, um, I don't know which one Grizabella is on. <laughs> yeah. You know? so, for um, sure. Right. So, but I would say that he has different criteria every year. Okay. So here's my question, my, my kind of fun version of this. I know as a kitten, Rumble Teaser's not making an argument for to being the Jellicle choice. What would your argument be if you wanted to say, hey, consider me this year. Gr- pretend Grizabella doesn't come back and Gus Ooh. has got at least a couple more years in him. And you're like, why not Why not us? Or even both you and Mungle Jerry. What would your uh, argument be for why you two should go? Hmm. So we should go. We should be chosen to come back in a new life. Uh, so maybe we could be, I don't know, what would be our argument? Well, sure, we're having too much fun in this life. So, 
you know, unless I wanted to come back in sexy bomb ballerina, but yeah, that would be later on down the line. So that would be kind of a selfish reason that it wouldn't really be a good argument that old Deuteronomy would, would buy that I want to come back as the sexy cat. Like, <laughs> yeah. Selfish, very <laughs> selfish reason. I'm, I'm ready for, yeah. for this version. I, yeah. I think the argument I could make for you all, and it would be hard because it would be McCavity would probably fit this argument too and more, mm -hmm. is if you're doing what's best for the tribe Ooh. and not necessarily what's best for that individual of like the, the heavy side layer is a redemption story and the one we get to see. But if it's a, we're just going to do what's best for the Jellicles, then probably getting rid of your villains and your mischief, mischievous, you know, ones that are causing more problems than they're helping Ooh. might be a way to kind of help the tribe as a whole. But I would say you probably choose McCavity before you choose Mother Jane Rumpel Teaser, who are, I would say, mischievous more than bad. And so, but that would be my argument of a, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's reward us as a way of like, we're so tired of these, these two troublemakers. We're going to get them out of the way and maybe they'll come back as, you know, more angelical cats. I think they, they tolerate us, the rest of the tribe and they, and old Deuteronomy would certainly give us time to mature. Yeah. So we'd have a little bit of time to mature and be guided by the rest of them. So there's hope for us. But yeah, we would give childlike excuses as why we should be chosen. Yeah. Probably because we don't know where we're going, but yeah, we can come back as what we want to come back as. But also it looks like an awful lot of fun going up on the yeah. big tire, right? Yeah. So as a kitten, I want to go up on that tire. I don't know where it's going or anything like that, but... Why can't I go up there? It looks like a fun ride, right? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I loved one thing you said earlier about this kind of conversation with Grizabella that is so interesting is you do embody your character so much that you're like, as a kitten, I didn't even know what she did that was bad. Like, I didn't even think about it. Like the, the adults did that for us. And yeah. so it is such a, like a, you know, you, you embody your character there versus kind of saying, all right, let me assess this whole story from start to finish. It's like, no, you got to stay in your rumple teaser mindset. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love yeah. it. She's not that deep. No. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> she's smart, though. And yeah. Yeah. She's uh, cunning and witty, and she tries to outsmart Mungo. Love it. Well, yeah. this has been so fun. Uh, thank you for taking a trip down memory lane. I didn't realize I was going to have you have to reminisce all these fires in your life that you're familiar <laughs> with, but uh, it's been fun to hear about your experience and um, how you've thought about the, the show as Rumble Teaser. Thank you, Mike. This was a lot of fun. It was Amazing. great to go down memory lane. So I appreciate it. Loved having you. So thank you. And thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cast catastrophe. To follow along, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else to listen to podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and threads at The Wrong Cat Died, or check out our website, thewrongcatdied.com.